And that is a good uh, place to introduce uh, now Denise Faustman, Professor Denise Faustman from, from Harvard University in the US, because you are actually, I think, going to present some, uh, some results uh, which are, are super intriguing and, and, and fill source, yeah, supply this uh, discussion on whether BCG could affect incidence or severity or or both, and whether that also depends on the cohorts that we are studying. So it's a great honor to introduce uh, Denise to all of you and her presentation of the BCG trial that she was ahead of doing uh, when, when COVID-19 came, uh, because she had already randomized a lot of people to BCG or no BCG. Denise, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yes, when COVID um, took off, uh, Christine was the first one to call me and she said, of course you're monitoring for COVID. I go, yes, we're in at the FDA. We're trying to get this permission. So this trial is very different than the other trials you're going to hear about uh, today because it's in the U.S. population. BCG has never been used in the U.S. Uh, so these are 100% uh, people that have uh, never seen BCG and also at the time of the original enrollment of the first trial uh, were all screened for um, by the T-spot test to have never had tuberculosis. So this is a very naive uh, U.S. population that also um, are all type 1 diabetics that have increased susceptibility to infections overall. So um, very different than the South African study and the Danish study and other studies we heard about, US population never vaccinated, US population uh, screened for negative for TB. This is a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial. And at the start of the pandemic, why Christine called me is she knew what we had already uh, randomized in this uh, double-blinded phase two, phase three trial. Um, people receiving three uh, BCG vaccines uh, for the metabolic effects, off-target effects, and diabetes. So they had been vaccinated exactly uh, during a time period two years prior to the pandemic. You'll see that's really relevant to the data we'll show you later on. This is a full FDA oversight and audited clinical trial. Um, all data was analyzed by independent data safety monitoring board, and it's classified by the FDA as a phase two, phase three clinical trial. So um, here are the differentiators and really the lessons uh, we've learned the hard way in autoimmunity over the last three years and uh, why this trial was uh, designed in the way it was. In all the trials in autoimmunity, whether it's in type 1 diabetes or the trials in Italy uh, with Dr. Ristori in multiple sclerosis, for the clinical effects to occur, and of course the clinical effects in diabetes are a lowering of the hemoglobin A1C and a change in use of uh, a glucose in MS, it's neuroregeneration and less relapses. It takes two to three years from the initial vaccines to the clinical outcomes. So for us working in autoimmunity, our trials are always five years long in order for us to see that inflection point. So uh, this data similarly is designed for the COVID-19 outcome as these people were vaccinated over the three year, two year time period before COVID um, appeared in the US. The other lesson we've learned in autoimmunity in uh, trial after trial after trial is that single dosing is almost uh, never effective and that multi-dosing is more effective. I guess that's the same lesson they've learned in bladder cancer. So uh, for all our trials in humans as well as old fish and mouse studies in autoimmune mouse studies, you have to give greater than two vaccines to see a favorable outcome. So we always multi-dose in these trials, especially in the US population where everybody's uh, BCG and tuberculosis uh, negative. And the other hard lesson we've learned in autoimmunity, again, from clinical trials, is the BCG strain makes a difference. Um, I don't often talk about it, but there were trials using the Merck Tice strain many years ago uh, in Canada and the US and in Europe, they totally failed. But uh, using the Moreau strain in, Austra uh, in Israel, they saw a signal. And then subsequently, um, both the Pasteur and the Japanese strain um, in Italy and the US have shown great efficacy. 
So the three lessons we've learned in autoimmunity is one, it for naive adult patients, it takes two to three years for the epigenetic imprinting to occur for the clinical outcome. Uh, we need multi-dosing and um, also BCG strain uh, makes a big difference. So we were uh, kind of set up for COVID uh, when COVID appeared. Um, so uh, this crowd is uh, very educated on uh, BCG differences, but I just present them. Um, you have to be careful of which BCG strain you're using. Certainly there's been double uh, blind and randomized trials, uh, many of them in bladder cancer, um, comparing different uh, strains head to head. Uh, and Japan BCG always seems to win. And at the bottom of the pile is the Thai strain. Um, also other um, uh, studies by other people looking at the basic science of these strains. Again, seeing uh, these strain differences in efficacy, often measured by uh, TNF secretion. So we have many trials going on here uh, at the MGH uh, for um, uh, type 1 diabetes and also as many of you guys now know, uh, uh, phase two trials for Alzheimer's as well. So um, the trial we had going uh, when Christine called me was obviously our phase two randomized double-blinded placebo-controlled trial in people with long-term type one diabetes, but with no complications. Um, so that group was already being studied for all infectious diseases because of the work of many people here on this call. So we already were collecting uh, infectious disease incidences. So we needed to go back to the FDA to uh, buttress that with COVID-19. Um, uh, collections. Um, um, and again, um, the off-target effects um, in uh, type 1 diabetes that impact metabolism as well as the immune system um, take many years to occur if you want a clinical outcome, not just a biomarker outcome. Um, and that is the, the rather dramatic uh, decrease in hemoglobin A1Cs in pure uh, juvenile onset diabetics are on the right in multiple sclerosis. Again, three years for the clinical outcomes to get clinically significant. Um, this is um, the changes in methylation that buttress uh, in naive cohorts, why we have to wait so long. This just happens to be, as everybody on this call knows, uh, Tregs are induced in the site of the tuberculous uh, granuloma. And uh, what we see systemically is also the T regs gradually being restored back to normal by the demethylation of these central signature genes. And note how they keep demethylating through year three to almost get back to normal levels of expression. And uh, this is also uh, well studied now for FOXP3. In autoimmune diseases, there's overmethylation of uh, FOXP3. It doesn't matter whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or type 1 diabetes. And uh, the time course for multi dosing BCG vaccines and an impact on the promoter of the FOXP3 gene is really uh, three years out. And that's what correlates with clinical outcome. So this was the uh, trial that was ongoing uh, when COVID broke out. It was a double-blinded randomized clinical trial in people with juvenile onset type 1 diabetes, but with about 15 years duration of the disease. At the time of the COVID outbreak, they had already had three BCG or placebo vaccines. We immediately in January of 2020 uh, went to the FDA to start to negotiate uh, this parallel trial design of seeing if the BCG vaccine in naive US population would be protective. Um, we were asked by the FDA to do the same sorts of outcomes that they were uh, starting to uh, formulate for the Moderna and Pfizer trials. They wanted to know in symptomatic people, what was the outcome with um, infectious disease testing on a molecular basis, either an antibody or a PCR testing uh, came along. Of course, and in dedication to everybody here on this phone call, we were uh, collecting data on infectious diseases for the two to three years before this. And of course, we were collecting data uh, during this time period now focused on COVID-19. We also did a side study of household members to see if the data would hold up. And then the trial was completed prior to anybody getting 
a COVID-19 vaccine. So this is gonna be a very important point that's been mentioned this morning is like not only this data, but what is gonna be the data after this study as all these people then um, emerge back into the healthcare system and get COVID-19 vaccines, flu vaccines, et cetera. How is the data gonna change? So that data we don't have yet, that data is being collected, but I think it'll be very informative to try to put these pieces together. So uh, this is what's um, on file at the FDA. It's one enrollment site, but the collection of these patients was US-based. These were actually live visits. People still traveled. They rented RVs and drove from Minnesota to Boston to make sure they made every single uh, visit. So we had really uh, continuous serum collections to make sure that uh, we had good monitoring of whether they had um, um, an antibody response to COVID. This is using the Tokyo 172 strain of Japan, which we think has equal potency to the uh, Pasteur strain and has worked very well in multiple sclerosis and type one diabetes. Again, it was symptomatic disease, uh, obviously monitoring for uh, severity using the COVID-19 surveys uh, provided by uh, the FDA. Um, the antibodies we measured uh, to COVID were really diverse. We used the COVID scan uh, protein array, which really displays every single fragment of the spike protein to make sure we captured everybody who uh, might get um, uh, COVID uh, by serology conversion. We also uh, used an FDA approved ELISA assay as well as uh, combined when available uh, the point of care testing of RT-PCR antigen testing and another approved uh, ELISA by the FDA. So this is the data. So each one of these graphs is a different assay um, looking for the diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. Um, nine of the 10 of these uh, relate to antibodies. The last one uh, relates to point of care testing, mostly um, uh, PCR. And what you see is regardless of the antibody we're looking to, to whatever region of the spike protein, you can see that the placebo group was getting more COVID uh, than the control group. So you can march through each of these regions of the COVID spike protein and see uh, just with your eyeball, this data was not hard for the statisticians uh, to analyze that the placebo group was getting COVID-19 diagnosed by at least five antibodies to uh, the virus and one point of care testing. The only spike region that did not give statistical significance was spike region two, where the p-value is 0.08. But even singularly, if you looked at even just one region of the spike protein, you could see that there was a major difference between the orange line and uh, the blue line. So this was um, extremely uh, strong data showing there was a difference in the ability of BCG vaccinated people versus placebo vaccinated type one diabetics to resist infection. This is the raw data on the left and the raw data says it all, okay? So here is people with symptomatic, they had to fill out the uh, FDA uh, survey uh, saying they had a fever, they had a sore throat, you know, uh, they didn't go to work. And then uh, we had serology always within three months and it looked at every single uh, region of the spike protein for antibodies. And what you can see is that although the BCG group and placebo group uh, that reported symptoms, um, um, only a few of the BCG group, if at all, uh, actually got um, a significant COVID-19 uh, infection, but the placebo group had uh, exposure to the COVID-19 virus quite uh, vigorously. This is um, also represented by Z-scores with just plus negative of a Z-score greater than three, showing the marked difference in serology between these two groups of people followed for uh, 15 months. Uh, this would have been the alpha variant of COVID-19. 
We did not, um, when we started this trial, PCR was not readily available for all people. Many of these people uh, uh, didn't have access to it uh, in the US um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But when PCR became available, uh, through the uh, provisional approvals through the FDA, people also started getting PCR testing. This was not the sole outcome of this trial. If we had used it as the sole outcome, first of all, you see that there was no testing in the first six months of this trial because PCR testing wasn't available. But if we had used it, you can uh, rapidly see that um, uh, we would have been reporting that the uh, BCG had 100% efficacy of uh, symptomatic disease versus the um, uh, placebo group. But that was not our predetermined outcome. Our predetermined outcome was five of eight diagnostics positive for COVID-19. So in fact, PCR alone testing would have over uh, overestimated the efficacy of BCG in this naive population. The next slide. Let's see if I can move to the next slide. Okay, um, so um, uh, similar to the reporting for Moderna or Pfizer, uh, the outcome was COVID-19 confirmed by point of care and SARS COVID-2 uh, antibodies. You can see that the vaccine efficacy was 92% and the posterior probability equivalent to Moderna and Pfizer was 0.99. If we had only read this trial out with PCR, which was not the outcome, so just being careful here on what I say, it would have read out that we had 100% vac vaccine efficacy, but our uh, serology decreased that number slightly, but this efficacy is equivalent uh, to the Moderna and Pfizer trials, which were being run at the same time period. Um, everybody's going to ask me, because this is a really educated crowd, not in the T-cell sense, but <laughs> in the BCG sense. So what happened with asymptomatic people? So if you go back and you run the serology in everybody, so uh, regardless whether you had a symptom or not, you can again see the fairly uh, dramatic effect of uh, BCG um, um, uh, protecting you uh, from the conversion uh, to a serological response to SARS um, um, antibodies. Again, everybody in the placebo group uh, was really being exposed and sometimes then uh, having symptoms and going on to uh, disease traits. Okay, next slide. Okay, so everybody wants to know about overall infectious disease protection. Uh, it's kind of a missed uh, fact, but people with autoimmunity have intrinsic uh, defects, uh, per, uh, making them more susceptible to infections. Uh, it's not related to glycemic control. It's present uh, throughout their disease. So this is an uh, 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 interesting population to do these trials in. So um, what we can say is during the trial period, okay, looking at all infections, they're monitored in this trial by, have you used any antibiotics? Have you been, been sick any day? And those were uh, continuously being collected before this trial started. Uh, but during this trial period, you can see over the 1.5 years that the cumulative infectious disease rate was uh, definitely more beneficial uh, for less infection in the BCG group than the placebo group. But what's really important is remember, these people were in a pretrial period of 30 months getting their multiple BCG vaccines before COVID came. So now if you look at the protection from infectious diseases during these first 30 months, you do not see a statistical difference between these two groups. And this buttresses the finding that in naive subjects that are now just getting exposed to BCG, it takes a while for these effects to occur. Um, and so we do not see infectious disease protection in the pretrial 30 month period, but we see um, uh, good protection from overall infectious diseases. And I can provide you a list of what those hits were, um, but uh, certainly the BCG group is lower during the uh, later part of this trial. We also monitored, according to the FDA, the um, average workdays missed, the infectious disease index, all those parameters that have now become fairly standardized for these trials. 
Therefore, the conclusions from this trial in this uh, phase two, phase three, double-blinded randomized trial show that three BCG vaccines provided 93 to 100% efficacy for protection from COVID. This was with the Tokyo BCG strain. This is in a time period where they were not receiving any other vaccines. They were receiving multiple doses of BCG over the pre two year time period. Um, it protected from symptomatic and asymptomatic COVID and the infections to COVID were confirmed by two methodologies, uh, point of care PCR testing when available as well as uh, serology defining the entire spike protein. So overall, this uh, 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 regimen in these naive patients showed uh, infectious disease protection, but only after uh, a two-year time period. So uh, that's my story on BCG. And of course, this presentation on this call, because I'm probably one of the few non-infectious disease doctors um, on this trial, but we're more than happy to monitor multiple outcomes in this trial. And we were just uh, very fortunate to have this randomization done to capture this uh, unique period in the US population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. You're a firecracker always. And, and once more, did it uh, show us some, some amazing results, which we unfortunately have very little time to discuss. We need to move on with the next presentation. But there are questions in the Q&A for you to uh, answer, maybe, and, and otherwise we'll take them up in the panel discussion. Uh, we have now finalized five presentations on BCG vaccine, and they have heterogeneous results, as we will see. And, and we have the Greek trial and your trial showing protective effects against COVID-19 and overall and, and, and three other studies which are uh, less positive and also suggest interactions. And I, I think you just threw in yet another potential effect modifier, which is the, the time of follow-up and maybe the six months that all of us went with uh, during our trials was really too short to actually capture the effect. So I think that's, that's an extremely important message we got here.